Let's turn to Esther 9 this morning. We'll begin in verse 21, I believe it is, and read through the end of the book. We come to the grand finale uh, today. I'm sorry to see it come to an end, and I hope you are as well. Last week, we considered the great reversal. Uh, The Jews were uh, supposed to be annihilated, and in fact, it was just the reverse. It was the enemies of God's people, 800 in Susa and 75,000 throughout the entire empire that were annihilated. And uh, the people of God uh, in the process uh, gained uh, power and prominence and, uh, and peace thanks to uh, Haman, the villain uh, who conspired against uh, the Jewish people Uh, They were much better off after than they ever were before. Strange how God works, isn't it? But as Psalm 76 says, the wrath of man will praise God. Even the wrath of man will be used to evoke praise uh, to Almighty God. Or as we sung in the opening hymn, though great distress my soul befell, the Lord my God did all things well. Let us pray. Lord, thank you for the way you do all things well. Though we are tried and tested and distressed so often, uh, we know that you do all things well. You make no mistakes. All things work together uh, for our good and for your glory. So we thank you for your wonderful providence and sovereignty. Uh, unseen, unheard so often, but uh, true and uh, experienced time and again by your people. So bless us now as we wrap up this uh, wonderful book and uh, may, we, uh, may we be teachable. We know that fools despise wisdom and instruction, but the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge and wisdom. And so give us ears to hear that we may be taught, that we may learn and grow and be more and more conformed to the likeness and image of our blessed Redeemer, the Lord Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Esther 9, verse 21, beginning of verse 20. And Mordecai recorded these things and sent letters to all the Jews who were in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus, both near and far, obliging them to keep the 14th day of the month Adar, and also the 15th day of the same, year by year, as the days on which the Jews got relief from their enemies, and as the month that had been turned for them from sorrow into gladness, and from mourning into a holiday, that they should make them days of feasting and gladness, days for sending gifts of food to one another and gifts to the poor. So the Jews accepted what they had started to do and what Mordecai had written to them. For Haman the Agagite, the son of Hamadatha, the enemy of all the Jews, had plotted against the Jews to destroy them and had had cast poor, that is, cast lots, to crush and destroy them. But when it came before the king, he gave orders in writing that his evil plan that he had devised against the Jews should return on on his own head and that he and his son should be hanged on the gallows. Therefore they called these days Purim, after the term pure. Therefore, because of all that was written in this letter and what they had faced in this matter and of what had happened to them, the Jews firmly obligated themselves and their offspring and all who joined them that without fail they would keep these two days according to what was written and at the time appointed every year, that these days should be remembered and kept throughout every generation and every clan, province, and city And that these days of Purim should never fall into disuse among the Jews, nor should the commemoration of these days cease among their descendants. Then Queen Esther, the daughter of Abihel and Mordecai the Jew, gave full written authority confirming this second letter about Purim. The letters were sent to all the Jews, to the 127 provinces of the kingdom of Ahasuerus, in words of peace and truth. That these days of Purim should be observed at their appointed seasons, as Mordecai the Jew and Queen Esther obligated them, and as they had obligated themselves and their offspring 
with regard to their fasts and their lamenting. The command of Queen Esther confirmed these practices of Purim and it was recorded in writing. King Ahasuerus imposed tax on the land and on the coastlands of the sea and all the acts of his power and might and the full account of the high honor of Mordecai to which the king advanced him are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Media and Persia? For Mordecai the Jew was second in rank to King Ahasuerus and he was great among the Jews and popular with the multitude of his brothers for he sought the welfare of his people and spoke peace to all his people. Amen. All flesh is grass and all its loveliness is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Amen. Don't you love happy endings? Uh, you love a good uh, a book that has a happy ending. You, you love a movie that has a happy ending. You, you even love a sermon that has a happy ending, don't you? Or is it that you just love a sermon that has an ending? <laughs> I love happy endings. And years ago, my, uh, I think she was just my girlfriend at the time, went to see uh, Kramer versus Kramer. Any of you see that movie? It's about a divorce. And uh, I remember being somewhat angry when the movie was over and uh, thinking, I'll, I'll not do that again. I will not waste my money, which I don't have much to waste, but I'll not waste what little I have on something so depressing. It was a, it was a miserable ending, as, as I recall. More fundamentally, why waste our faith on something that has an unhappy ending? You ever thought about that? Paul said it well, if our if, uh, if our faith has an unhappy ending, this is Jim's paraphrase, if our faith has an unhappy ending, we're of all men the most to be pitied. We're wasting a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of prayer, a lot of everything, aren't we? But I've got good news for you. Our faith has a very uh, euphoric ending. And we saw a glimpse of it there in the, our reading from Revelation 19. Did you notice all the hallelujahs all over the place? I mean, people and creatures and whatnot, hallelujah, 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 <laughs> time and time again. And let us rejoice and let us exult and let us give him glory. They just uh, sort of this unrestrained, euphoric exuberance, uh, the most happy, probably a happier ending than any of us can even imagine. Years ago, there were a group of <clears throat> Welsh ministers and they were sitting in a railway carriage discussing the book of Revelation. And the old uh, ticket collector came into their carriage and he paused uh, for a few moments to listen to the conversation. And one of the ministers said, we're speaking about the book of Revelation. Do you know anything about it? They asked, or he asked. And the old ticket collector looked at them and said, the lamb wins. That, my friends, is the gospel. That's the message of Esther. God wins. That's the message of the Bible. God wins. And because he wins, we win. The right man, hallelujah, the right man is on our side. The man of God's own choosing, Christ Jesus, it is he. And if he be for us, who can be against us? There may be some trials and tribulations. There are. No maybe about it. There are plenty of trials and tribulations and great distress. My soul be fell, but the day will come as the Jews did in Esther's day. And we'll say, the Lord my God did all things well. So notice, uh, first of all, the, the pleasure that uh, the people of God enjoyed. Verse 22 <clears throat> As the days on which the Jews got relief from their enemies and as the month that had been turned for them from sorrow into gladness and from mourning into a holiday that they should make them days of feasting and gladness, days for sending gifts of food to one another 
and giving gifts to the poor. Winston Churchill once said, there's nothing more exhilarating in all of life than to be shot at without result. (laughs) I'll take his word for it. (laughs) The Jews were shot at without result, and it was so exhilarating, and there was to be this great pleasure, days of feasting and gladness. I mean, a holiday is great in and of itself. But throw in good food and lots of it and and feasting and exchanging of gifts and so forth. It was Christmas in Persia. Days of feasting and gladness. You ever noticed how those Old Testament assemblies that God commanded his people to observe, what were they called? Feasts. Feasts or festivals. And so at Passover, they ate the lamb. And at uh, Pentecost, it was the barley harvest or the wheat harvest. And at Tabernacles, it was the entire uh, fall harvest safely gathered in ere the winter storms began. God was teaching his people, commanding his people to gather and celebrate his redemptive acts in history with food. (laughs) and drink in addition to sacrifices and offerings because he's very smart, you see. He's omniscient. You like to eat? Anybody here doesn't like to eat? We'll find a counselor for you. (laughs) People love to eat. How many of you are thinking about lunch right now? Have you looked at your watch yet? I bet some of you. How many of you are honest? We think about food all the time. We love to eat. We don't have to be told to eat. It's just second nature to us, isn't it? Sometimes we have to be told not to eat. Sometimes we need a little help in that area, don't we? But people love to eat, and we have to eat. And the better the food, I've got a a dinner tomorrow night. I've been thinking about today, going out to a nice restaurant, and I'm already excited about it. So I'm not thinking about lunch today. I'm thinking about dinner tomorrow night. But you're the same way. We love to eat, and God knows it. God doesn't ask us to celebrate his redemption in history by digging ditches or doing some sort of manual labor, does he? And this this is where the world lies to us because the world tells us that salvation is just the opposite, that it's a famine that you'll starve, that you'll die. That if you want to live and you want to enjoy the good life, you have to get in the fast lane and you have to run with the fast crowd and you need to try sex and you need to try uh, drugs and you need to try all sorts of things that the world just thinks is the greatest thing around. Our youngest son just uh, had a friend of his little brother uh, overdosed on drugs a couple of nights ago and died and we feel very bad for the family somewhere along the line somebody said here's the way to have life try these drugs and next thing you know uh, the boy's enslaved it's a sin that so easily besets us entangles us it takes life it doesn't give life The Christian life and the Lord Jesus Christ said, I've come that you might have life and have it abundantly. And the Christian life is rich and free and full and deeply satisfying and deeply fulfilling. You like to eat. You like to party. You like to have a good time. And here it is on this mountain The Lord Almighty will prepare a feast, the prophet says. A feast of rich food for all peoples. A banquet of aged wines. The best meats, the finest wines. It's the salvation feast. This is where we find life and fun and joy and rest and peace. I miss Opryland. Any of you miss Opryland? 
theme park. I was thinking about Opryland this week. <clears throat> and when our kids were young, we'd take them out there. And one time I was standing in this long line to ride the bumper cars. Do you remember bumper cars? I always liked those things. <laughs> Finally, we got up near the front. And I was watching the group bumping in front of us. And I noticed two women with gray hair. And they each had their own car. And they were laughing and screaming and bumping each other and challenging each other. And then the most shocking thing, when it ended, they had to be helped out of their <laughs> car. One of them had a cane. <laughs> and she hobbled off the floor. But let me tell you, old age doesn't disqualify you from having a good time, does it? I got the feeling they'd done it before and they'd do it again because they were having the time of their lives. As should we, of all people, we have reason to have joy and celebrate. And speaking of doing it again, we notice, secondly, the permanence of this feast. Verse 27, the permanence of this celebration. The Jews firmly obligated themselves and their offspring and all who joined them that without fail they would keep these two days according to what was written and at the time appointed every year. Verse 28, these days would never fall into disuse among the Jews. Purim, from the word pure, P-U-R, meaning lot. Because you may remember back in chapter 3, verse 7, the villain Haman cast lots to determine the date on which the Jewish people would be annihilated. But it never happened because God intervened and he used Esther and he used Mordecai and so the reverse occurred and it's basically the latest chapter in the same story you've seen since Genesis 3.15 where God said that the seed of the devil would always, always wage war against the seed of the woman and time and again it happens whether it's Cain or Abimelech or Pharaoh, or uh, the Amalekites, or um, Athaliah, or Goliath, or Haman, or Herod in the New Testament, time and time and time again, the devil and the seed are waging war against the woman and her seed, trying to prevent the head crusher from ever being born. And the result's always the same. It's always predictable. God always wins. He sits in the heavens and laughs. And his people always get the joy and the peace. And to this day, as you probably know, the Jewish people still celebrate Purim. They'll celebrate it March 17 next year. They'll celebrate it March 7th, the year after that, and they will celebrate it until the end of the age, as well they should. And it's to be some kind of celebration, my friends, jovial, raucous. In fact, in the Jewish Talmud, instructions are given, <clears throat> quote, one should get so drunk, they don't get excited now, <laughs> that they cannot tell the difference between the phrases, cursed is Haman or blessed is Mordecai. The people are encouraged to dress up as characters from the story. The scroll of Esther is to be read, and it is customary to use noisemakers every time Haman's name is read. <laughs> we booed him. They just used noisemakers to drown him out. And finally, among the foods that are eaten is something called Osni or Osni Haman. I may be mispronouncing that. Meaning the ears of Haman. 
a triangular shaped cookie supposed to represent Haman's ears. No holds barred. <laughs> Go for all the gusto and celebrate as raucously and joyfully as possible for perpetuity. We do the same thing, dear friends. Not just Christmas, not just Easter. Every Sunday morning is to be a celebration of the great reversal we've experienced. We who once were without God and without hope in the world, far away, strangers and aliens to the covenants of grace, scheduled to be annihilated because the wages of sin is death. But boy, did our fortunes reverse when the Lord Jesus Christ died for our sins and rose for our justification. And therefore, I sing to the Lord, all the earth. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let's do it over and over and over again every Sunday morning. We gather to hear the gospel, good news, and celebrate the victory that we have in Jesus Christ our Lord. I told you I was thinking about Opryland this week. I don't know why. I guess it's hot weather and that's when we would go, but... Uh, Speaking of doing things over and over again, when our son Jimmy was um, only four years old, maybe three, I don't know, very young. Do you remember the log flume? Yeah, I liked the log flume. It was nice and refreshing when it was so hot. Jimmy didn't like the log flume. And you'd have thought that uh, we were torturing him. <laughs> so I, I physically took him and thrust him into the log. <laughs> And had to hold him there as we went, uh, you know, sailing along the water. Kristen and some of the girls were behind me. And, and I mean, he was screaming. It was embarrassing. <laughs> screaming and writhing. And I don't know what he would do if he'd gotten out of there, but he, he wanted out. And you know how the thing went up and over and around. And you get a little wet along the way. And then comes that great finale. And you come down this big steep incline and, poof, and you just get soaked with water. And he's sobbing and carrying on and just making me feel like a terrible father. And, but then, you know, you just glide peacefully to the finish line, don't you? And he said something through all the sobs and the sniffles and I couldn't hear him. And finally I said, what did you say, Jimmy? I want to do that again. <laughs> so we did. Again and again and again. When things are fun and when you have a good time, whether it's a ball game or a party, you like to relive it, don't you? You like to talk about it some more. Do it again. It's the way God's made us. And that's why he said one day out of seven we come together and we celebrate God's goodness. It's, our fortunes have been reversed and they'll never be reversed the other way because neither death nor height nor angels or principalities or powers, things present, things future, height nor depth, anything else will ever separate us from the love of God that's in Jesus Christ our Lord. So there you have it, my friends. There's Esther. Maybe we should do it again sometime. <laughs> it's really one long sermon, isn't it, about the providence of God. Somebody's done a little research and says that King Ahasuerus, or Xerxes if you prefer, is mentioned 192 times in the book. Almighty God as you know, is mentioned zero. So Ahasuerus, 192, God, zero. Ahasuerus gets all the ink. God gets all the glory, doesn't he? Yes, yes, yes. And sometimes people, people like to say, well, they, they bite their fingernails and gnash their teeth. Even God's people, well, what if, uh, you know, what if the... Uh, the Jews had been annihilated, but there would be no Jesus, there would be no Savior. Right? 
But what if uh, Vashti, way back there in chapter 1, what if she hadn't been the little mouse that roared? And, and what if she hadn't resisted what the king wanted her to do? What if Esther hadn't won the beauty pageant? What if Mordecai hadn't uncovered a plot to assassinate the king and he saved the king's life? And what if the king hadn't been sleepless one night? And what if the king hadn't asked for the government records to be read? And what if Esther hadn't been willing to intervene and risk her life? Let me tell you something. The what if game is a waste of time. Other than to marvel at the anonymous providence and the silent sovereignty of Almighty God who does all things well. All the Jewish people needed to know and all you and I need to know is what we sang earlier, that second hymn. Children of the Heavenly Father safely in his bosom gather Nestling bird nor star in heaven, such a refuge air was given. There's not a bird out there or a star up there that is safer than the people of God. All along, the Jews were safe. And all along, you and I are safe as well. By the way, that hymn was written by Swedish girl, woman, young woman, maybe a teenager, one afternoon after she had helplessly watched her father drown. He was a pastor. But still she wrote, more secure is no one ever than the loved ones of the Savior, not yon star on high abiding, nor the bird in home nest hiding. Father, thank you for the safety that uh, we enjoy because you are our great protector, defender, redeemer, and friend. We thank you for this book, for the wonderful lessons about your sovereignty and providence. We thank you for the blessed assurance that uh, you do all things well. And so we ask you to use your word once again to bear great fruit in our lives that we would be a, a believing people and a trusting people uh, knowing that, uh, that you make no mistakes and that you love your people with an everlasting love. So help us rejoice and celebrate and do it again and again and again. For Jesus' sake we pray. Amen.